We're turning tonight to the Gospel of Mark in chapter 4. We'll begin there in verse 35. Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. And the same day when even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over into the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Our Lord has been ministering the word to massive crowds of people so great that he, they had forced him to enter into one of the shipping vessels by the, the seashore, and they crowded on the shore and up the mountainside to hear him, but just the mere presence of the people was about to crush him, and this was the only way he could have any space or any respite from this horde of people. He preached to them from one of the boats, no doubt owned by either Peter or Andrew or James. They had left their fishing businesses to follow the Lord full time, learning to be apostles, but they'd kept these vessels and used them, no doubt, from time to time for the master's use, for transportation, and even here for a place for him to get away from the crowds. All that we have is the Lord's. We should be constantly reminded of that and be loaned. It's only on loan to us for his honor and for his glory and for our usage, but primarily for him. And what a freeing and a worshipful truth to learn that all you have is in the Lord's hands and from the Lord's hands and, and is at his disposal to use however he desires. The crowd throngs the seashore to hear our Lord's preaching. Many of them were sincere or would-be followers, uh, but many of them are curious onlookers. They are hoping for the next handout or to see the next miracle. You never knew what was going to take place when Jesus was ministering, and they certainly, many of them wanted, they were just curiosity seekers, but there was a, a great number of them that were b believing on him or coming to him, seeking for him. The Sea of Galilee is not really a sea at all. The old English word sea is a large body of water. And so it's a rather huge, large, freshwater lake. It's 13 miles long and 7 miles wide. The Sea of Galilee sits 690 feet below sea level, making it the lowest freshwater body on earth. And it's the most significant geographical feature in Galilee. It gets its water source from underground springs, but mostly from the Jordan River. And its water is clear, it's pristine, and even today it's a major source of drinking water, a water supply for the people who live in that area. And it uh, fosters a thriving fishing business, even as it did in our Lord's day. Today, the Sea of Galilee is known as Yom Kinnereth. And in the Bible, it's referred to by several different names, the Sea of Galilee, the Lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Chinnereth, the Sea of Tiberias in John chapter 6, after the city of Tiberias on its western shore, named after Tiberius Caesar Augustus. One writer notes the steep hills and the cliffs that surround the Sea of Galilee make it susceptible to high sudden winds, causing pop-up and severe hurricane-like storms at a moment's notice. Cool air travels down from the northern Golan Heights, colliding with the warm air in the basin of the lake, creating turbulent conditions that are intensified as the winds force their way through the various ravines and canyons of the upper Jordan Valley. In fact, in 1992, uh, this occurred, causing 10-foot high waves on the lake and flooding and great damage to the city of Tiberias. So the storm that we're reading about here in the scripture is not an uncommon common phenomenon on the Sea of Galilee or the, the, the Lake of Tiberias even today. 
just its geographical setting down in a bowl, mountains all around it, and the way it's situated makes it very susceptible to sudden storms. So after a long season of intense ministry, our Lord tells his disciples to take their little, he was in a boat with few, these boats are not very big, so only a few, not all the disciples were in one boat, the Lord and a few of them, and there was a little grouping of these boats, and he tells them to take their, their little fleet of boats to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, several miles across, as we've seen, some seven miles. He had taught them publicly and privately about the gospel ministry, as we've seen in the last few studies, the potential of the power yielding phenomenal results, but also to be aware in gospel work, as we've heard from our missionary tonight, of the various types of soil. We ought to always keep that in mind. Your students in your class, those that we're ministering to, their hearts, everybody's heart has a certain degree of, of softness uh, to the things of the Lord. And age does not make it softer. The older we get, sometimes it does the opposite. It gets harder. And so we always ought to pray for whoever is preaching or teaching and for whatever gospel ministry is going on, that those who will be the recipients of it, that their hearts will be soft and receptive. And we noticed that on Sunday afternoon as many of you went out and we were comparing notes about the various degrees of reception of people. But our Lord told us that. The whole parable of the souls is to equip us so we'll not be surprised by the response to gospel ministry. He taught them the importance of light, that we are light. His only light on earth are his people. And we, wherever we may be found, wherever the Lord has placed us, we are his light there to shine brightly as his exclusive witnesses. Angels don't preach. They minister. They do all kinds of things. But the only light the Lord has here, of course, is word. But his word must be used, utilized by his people primarily and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so angels have not been commissioned to do what we're called to do, to let our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. But rest assured, the kingdom of God is being built, even as we speak right now, silently, continually, as the gospel is being preached and taught and emulated and witnessed and discipled. And we take great uh, hope in that and, and great courage in that because our Lord said, I will build my church. And we can rest assured that he is presently doing that work even now. He's not come back. So he said, I will come again and receive you into myself. And so until that time, his work, his church is being built. Don't look at things by the feeble eye of sight, the sight of our eyes. These are spiritual things that are going on. It's too early to judge or to, to have a total harvest. That will not be until the judgment seat. There'll be a lot of surprises there, will there not? And so he tells his disciples here, let's pass over to the other side. That's not a suggestion. That is a command. It sounds like a suggestion, but the Lord intends for them to get to the other side. That's a very important part of this study because what the Lord intends to do, he will do. And that gives us great courage when we're doing what the Lord has told us to do, but under diverse circumstances or difficult circumstances. Let us go to the other side. Let that ring in your mind as we look at these verses because they will get to the other side. And may I say to you tonight, guess what? We will get to the other side. We will all arrive in heaven. The feeblest of the Lord's children will be among the saints of light around the marriage supper of the Lamb, giving praise to his name. The one with the weakest faith, the, the slightest Christian, however you want to define them, the least uh, important will be there. Let us pass into the other side. Clearly, this was to get away from the, for the, from the crowds for a period of time. And I want us to take note of that. We get a glimpse here of our Lord's humanity in a way that we don't often see him. To see how vulnerable, and I hate to use that word in reference to our Lord, but just in appearance, sound asleep. When you, is there anyone ever so vulnerable when they're asleep? And we see him there in the storm going around, uh, going on around them, his disciples becoming unglued, and there our Lord is asleep in the, the bottom of the ship. 
Our Lord does all things well, all things right on time, never wasting time, never off schedule. So this we know, that helps buoy us through these kinds of things that the Lord is exactly where he's supposed to be and where he told us he would be, and he's getting us there. So we see that it's not a waste of time to take needed rest. The psalm, psalmist said he giveth, beloved, his, it giveth sleep to his beloved. And that's a gift from the Lord. It's a design from the Lord for us, our bodies, to rest. Every night for several hours, we slip into a coma-like state designed by the Lord where our bodies and our brains are renewed and rested and recalibrated. It is his design. It's a wonderful thing. And on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, there were no major cities and much fewer people. So our Lord is purposely going to an unpopulated area. This is not unspiritual to get away from crowds and from people and from doing when, when it's time to recreate. That's what the word recreation means, to be rested and refreshed. And, but there was another reason for going there, not just for their and his personal rest. Remember, he had a human body that feels just like the glorified 100% Son of God had a body that was a human body in every way that ours is, okay? So that body got tired or he would not have slept. It got hungry, he would not have slept. And we see the humanity of our Lord. When we notice the humanity of our Lord, that does not at all de-emphasize his deity. These are both held in a mysterious, perfect balance that he was 100% God and 100% man at the same time. The difference being, of course, he had no sin nature. So whatever about the body is connected with the sin nature, we would assume that he did not have. Uh, I cannot imagine then that our Lord was ever sick with disease or a fever um, or anything like that in his perfect humanity. Although that body did get tired, it bled when it was uh, wounded and crucified, it hungered. So those things are not abnormal or wrong things. That's how the Lord has created us. But again, there was another reason for him going to the other side rather than just being rested. Our Lord had a divine appointment that we'll study about next, uh, next time we study to keep, as we see there in chapter 5, verse 1. And they came over to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes, and our Lord knew his schedule. He knew ahead of time every single thing, unlike us. He knew exactly what he would face every second of every day. And yet he moved unhurried, un, without fear, without trepidation, with great bravery, restfulness, peacefulness. And there was a poor demon-possessed man waiting for him on the other side. That man does not know he's about to meet the Son of God, but he is. The disciples don't know what lie ahead of them, but he does. And so they go over there for rest, and immediately they're going to be approached by this horrible man, horrible in that he was possessed by demons we refer to as the Gadarene demoniac. We're about to study two of Christ's miracles here side by side. One tonight, the stilling of the storm, and then next we'll be looking at that particular study of the demon-possessed man being released. The stilling of the storm and the delivering of the demon-possessed man. And so just a word about our Lord's miracles. There's a lot of misconception about them. And especially today when there's a, the, the, a movement that claims that, that uh, Almost everything's a miracle, and we should expect all kinds of miracles every time we turn around over everything. Let me just say here, the Lord is a miracle-working God. The fact that you're sitting tonight clothed and in your right mind is a miracle. We are all just as miraculous in our salvation as the deliverance of the gathering demoniac. So let me just, from the outset, tell you that I'm a believer uh, in the miracles of our Lord. But when you study the scripture, you see miracles, the emphasis of miracles, not unlike demon possession, are heightened at different times. We see the most of the Old Testament miracles happening in, during the ministry of Elijah and Elisha. We hear very little, and there are miracles, I'm not saying that, but the open public 
remarkable, all miracles are remarkable, but the, the majority of them are done under, under the, prophets, uh, the, the prophets of Messiah, uh, Elijah and Elisha. And then we see the great next outpouring of miracles are from the time of our Lord's uh, coming to earth, his ministry, throughout his public ministry, and the apostolic age, and the establishing of his church. Miracles fall into four categories in the New Testament. They all demonstrate one of four different things. First, our Lord's power over disease. He heals a paralyzed man in Matthew chapter 9. He heals a deaf mute in Mark 7. Uh, various are all kinds of diseases in Luke chapter 4. The healing of a lame man in John chapter 5. Blind men. We see, so they're very different, different diseases. Some from birth, some of fever, some of sickness, uh, maladies. So our Lord clearly has power over diseases. Now, during this time, there were almost no cures. Like we, we, we live in a, a day of great medical advancement, and we're used to people being healed. The death rate of people were, if you lived in your 50s, that was a remarkable thing. Childhood diseases took children. The things that are arrested in our day and time were just rampant. Uh, leprosy was still a major fearful disease. Any kind of fever, there were no antibiotics, no penicillin. And so as far as the realm of medicine that we are so comfortable with and almost casual about, death and severe sickness was a daily and constant fear of people during our Lord's earthly ministry. And so these healings, healing of any disease was rare. I'm not saying that they didn't have uh, procedures and things uh, that, you know, herbs and things that would help but but nothing like what we see today and so you lived every day with a fear of your child getting a fever or someone getting an infection and there was just nothing for it except beyond the, the normal bandaging something putting a poultice on it or something to, to that degree so when our Lord healed a disease it was remarkable in a way that that may not be today Secondly, they, the miracles show that his power over death. In Matthew 9, he raises a dead girl. In Matthew 7, he raises the only son of a widow. And the reason the emphasis of the only son of the widow, a widow had no hope if she did not have a child, a son, or a kinsman redeemer. She was the most vulnerable person in society. And so the emphasis of the only son means she had no hope if this son were to die. In John 11, he, of course, he raises Lazarus. And then his own remarkable resurrection was a miracle that he performed. Thirdly, his miracles show his power over sin and Satan. And, and by the way, let me just back up. No one had the power over death. Again, the prophet Elijah uh, raised a, man, a, a young man. But this was uncommon in every age, but especially during the, the New Testament age, the raising of the dead, that's uncommon at any time. Let's face it, that's not a, a common thing. So it's rare. It was in Bible times. And then thirdly, his miracles show his power over sin and Satan. Satan was greatly to be feared. And during this time, it's not as if Satan is not at work today. But the obvious outward possession of people was intensified just prior to the flood. The horrible, depraved uh, demon possession and during the time of our Lord's earthly ministry, we will see that increase again at his return to the earth. So there are these three great times of demonic activity just prior to the flood, when the human race was almost extinct, extinguished, uh, except for the Noah's family. Satan inspired that to thwart the coming of the Messiah. And then that the birth of Christ through his earthly ministry, the apostolic age, was still a great time of demon possession. And, and please don't misunderstand me. There's great demonic work. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And, uh, and, and demon possession is a real thing. I've seen it firsthand. But it is not as it was in our Lord's day or as it will be as we see the, the Lord approaching. We're seeing it ramped up around us now. Just unbelievable, atrocious, depraved um, this whole transgender thing where people are morphing and changing themselves, 
all of this is demon inspired and it's going to get worse just 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 to the point we could not believe that this would even be a talked about or somewhat of a common thing uh, even in our day he heals a boy with an evil spirit in mark chapter 9 he cast out many demons in luke chapter 4 so the miracle center in these four categories the power over disease the power over death the power over sin and satan and the power uh, uh, lastly his power over nature as we see here in our text this is a major uh, emphasis a major time where our lord shows that he has authority over the very force of nature not only does he steal storms he miraculously multiplies a little boy's lunch he has five loaves loaves and two fishes a little the fish some say about the size of your hand and yet he sits, seats the thousands of people in the groups of 50 and feeds them from a little boy's lunch that was miraculously reproduced every time a, a fish was handed out in a roll it was it didn't deplete until they were all fed and they took up 12 baskets of leftovers one for each apostle i guess i'm not sure but there were 12 left over at the end of that and that's a miracle it's a creative miracle he created uh before their eyes then there was his first miracle at the wedding of cana where he transformed water and everyone knew it was water he told the servants go get water they filled these huge several hundred gallons of water pots and he turned it into wine and it was widely known the, the the people saw it and marveled at it and so these are creative acts deeds only god can do why were they done then to prove the lord's deity to prove that jesus christ was indeed messiah the one of the phrases the old testament with healing in his wings that means he would have the power to heal the various descriptions of messiah these were known that when messiah came great things would be done that he would have great power and so the miracles were to prove that god has come to earth messiah is here to prove his deity and that he indeed was the son of god please note unlike what we see in some corners today what seems to be miracles were never performed for entertainment or curiosity that was never done to simply wow the audiences with uh, amazement like at a circus act or a las vegas show when they you know they purport to make an elephant disappear or these are sleight of hand or a smoke and mirror kind of setups you know you're being fooled when you watch that kind of thing and that the, the female assistant isn't literally being sawed in half you know that can't be true you can't explain it it looks like it's done and people call these things miracles but uh, they're not neither were jesus miracles performed simply out of compassion as, as they many the people who were recipients of those physical miracles it was compassionate but that's not the primary reason why the lord performed them though our lord showed great compassion to those suffering our lord contrary to what some may think or uh, put forth our lord did not heal every single person he came in contact with or raise every dead person in his in his area example in john chapter 5 verse 2 we'll just look at one at the pool of Beth bethesda we read there was a great multitude of powerless people they in that day thought that the first rippling of the water it was a huge vast public pool and they've uncovered these recently in archaeology the uh, the pool of Beth bethesda though the the legend was at the first rippling of the water the first person who was in after that rippling would be healed they thought when the water rippled whether it was wind blew it or whatever they said an angel did it and the first person in was healed and every day hundreds and hundreds were brought there and this man had been sick afflicted for over 30 years and obviously he couldn't walk and the Lord approached this one man and said, what will you, what will thou do that I do to you? And he said, I have no one to help me into the water. I'm never able to get into it. I don't, it's almost like I don't have a chance. And he said, that, that be made whole. Just to note, our Lord did not heal every one of those people around the pool of Bethesda. He healed this one man. 
And so, he, because his primary reason wasn't come to come to be the great physician, although he is a great physician, his primary reason, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And all these fringe blessings and miracles, valid and real as they were, were all to bolster the fact that this was the Savior, the Messiah, the one who'd come to die for, and suffer for our sins. And, and to, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was, was upon him. And by his stripes, we're healed. That's primarily, although physical healing certainly is, is, is brought about by our Lord, primarily it was the healing of the sin-sick soul. And if we ever lose sight of that, we will make the Lord into a, a genie or a Santa Claus or something, a, a Buddha or good luck charm. And that's not who he is. He is the Son of God come to earth to seek and to save that which was lost. And I, don't, I say that without minimizing his miraculous power. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth, he said. So the miracles were proof that he was fully able to do just that, to seek and to save that which was lost. And just to note, every person that our Lord heal, healed eventually would die of something. Even Lazarus uh, and the others that he rose from the dead died again. In fact, there is a tomb in Turkey that is inscribed, here lies the one who, was who died and was raised and died again. And it's, got, it's, it's purported to be the tomb of Lazarus. I don't know if it is, but we do know that Lazarus died. He's not with us, and he wasn't raptured. And so that's not minimizing the, that the Lord raised him from the dead. But the Lord is going to raise all of his followers from the dead at some point. But I want us to examine the miracle before us in our text. We see there in verse 36, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. That phrase, they took him even as he was, he just stayed in the ship where he'd been teaching, and they began to loose them from the shore and began to go to the other side. And there arose a great storm of wind. So it wasn't just rain. This was a violent hurricane-like storm so that they, the ship was now full or now being filled. This ship, this little boat, is taking on water who wouldn't be afraid? But during the voyage over, our Lord got down into the stern of the boat, found a leather cushion. All these boats had this little leather cushion that the, the pilot or the captain would sit on. He found this cushion on these hard boards in the bottom of this boat and uh, fell asleep. What a picture. I hope you can picture our Lord there, peaceful, sound asleep in this ship. The sudden hurricane, the storm, did not rouse him. So he was sound asleep. That's, that's, being, that's very sound asleep, isn't it? And he was impervious to it all. And he blocked it out or was just that much at peace in his Father's will. And what a great lesson it is for us to rest in the Lord because these circumstances are beyond our ability to do anything about. All the rowing and expertise would not have affected that boat one bit. There was nothing anybody could do but wait and see what happened. You could, your skill, your craftsmanship, your being an able sailor had nothing to do in the midst of this kind of storm. They were like bottles on the, in the water. And someone has written... Perhaps nowhere else in the scripture is the humanity of Christ more dramatically juxtaposed with his deity than here. The one sleeping in the stern of the boat, exhausted after a day of intense ministry, is the very one who would awaken to stop the massive storm with a word. And what a picture there. Our Lord asleep. Here's a time of severe testing of the disciples' faith. And that's part of what the Lord has in mind here. He will perfect our faith. That part is beyond us. We must and should cooperate with him. But his goal, please rest assured and wake up every day knowing that our Lord is tirelessly working on us to conform us to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So all this stuff that happens to you every day is part of your sanctification. Now, you can get mad about it, 
and not grow, or you can welcome it and say, Lord, you know, teach me to, to be and to, to grow and to pass this test because I don't want to take it again. And help me to, to conform uh, to your working in my life. Spurgeon said, we have no more faith at any time than we have in the hour of trial. Warren Wiersbe says, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Anything that will not endure testing is merely fleshly confidence. We can boast loud and big, but it's in the hour of trial that shows what we really are and how much faith we really have. And God is always at work to increase our faith. We have an endless capacity for faith. And here our Lord rebukes them and says, you have no faith. They failed the faith test here. What a horrible test for those who are going to be God's representatives on earth. God only had one son who was tried without sin, but he has no sons who will not be tested. And I want to remind us of several things about storms here. This uh, picture, this analogy of testing in our lives. While it was a real, real and literal storm, it was just the means that the Lord was used to test them. The storms of your life, we call them that, circumstances, things, people, situations, we can call them storms, or whatever you want to call them. They're all for the Lord's use to sanctify us, to make us more Christ-like. First of all, the th something we need to observe about storms is that there's something over which you have absolutely no control. The eclipse happened, was it yesterday, day before yesterday, I've lost track, and you had not one thing to do about it. Couldn't stop it, couldn't cause it, couldn't, couldn't make it clearer. You had, it, was, it came. The storm is the same way. The weather, you have no control over it. And so they had no absolute, absolutely no control over this, this storm, neither their timing of the storm. They never happened when you wanted to happen. Who would ever want a storm, by the way? Or the, du du their duration or their extent. Job is an example of that. They're often that's the, the, their reason to show you who is in control, that you're not in control of it. We think we are, but we're not. We're not in control of anything. Only our Lord is. You're, you're in control of your attitude, your response to the storms, but other than that, that's as far as it goes. Secondly, storms are bigger than you are, aren't they? These are obvious observations, but just to remind ourselves, you're at their mercy you can go argue with a tornado if you want to, but this is not convenient. I don't want you to tear up my house. It didn't matter. All that kind of stuff is foolish. You're at the mercy of the storm. Number three, storms unsettle us. And, and rightfully so. They're scary. They stir us up. They, they sometimes reveal the worst in us, a storm will. But they force us to take some action in some way. Fourthly, we're rarely prepared for them. You, you may feel like you are, but when that day of devastation comes, that trial, the bad situation, that you, we're never really ready for that. We don't want it. We didn't think about it. We didn't wake up this morning thinking, I wonder what all the storms are going to happen today, or we, if this is the big one. Or, you know, we, we don't think that way. So we're, not, we're rarely prepared for them. Although, as we read the Lord's Word every day and feed on Him and pray, our, our souls should be steeled and, and, and strong and, and fastened on Christ so that when the storm comes, it won't knock us off our feet. Fifthly, they have the, the potential for great devastation. Storms can absolutely wreck or ruin a life uh, if not received and, 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 and allowed and yielded to in the Lord's what he's doing there. We'll say more about that in just a moment. But I want us to observe some things about this particular storm with these disciples, and then there will be a help to us. You'll notice, first of all, that they were in the path of duty when the storm occurred. So this was, they were not being disciplined for sin. Sometimes we are, but that's not what this is about. The Lord, he said, we're going, let us go to the other side. So they were just doing what he said to do. They would have been more safe had they stayed on the seashore and, and got in a cave or some place of safety. But the Lord said, okay, we're through ministering here. We have an appointment on the other side. Let's go to the other side. And so they began to do that. They, they lifted anchor or unfastened the ropes, whatever it was, and they were obeying the Lord, doing exactly what he told them to do. 
a common misconception among the followers of the Lord is if I'm doing what he's told me, if I'm in God's will, living right, you know, the checklist, these kind of things shouldn't happen. Wrong. That's false reasoning. I don't know where we get that reasoning, but it's not from the Bible. These men were doing exactly what the Lord told them to do when the storm came. Obedience as a follower of Christ does not exempt us from storms or testing. In fact, because we are followers of Christ, we will go into trials. Count it all joy, James tells us, when you fall into diverse kinds, different kinds of tests. Anything that crosses our path is allowed by the Lord. You need to know that. This is the sovereignty of God. He's in control. He either allows it or orchestrates it as part of his will for us. This is a mysterious part of the will of God that we don't fully understand, but we need to remind ourselves what his word tells us. And mysterious and unwelcomed as they may be, they're for the perfecting of our faith. And God is more concerned about the perfecting of your faith than he is your comfort. You're more concerned about your comfort and pleasure than you are about your holiness you're, you're more concerned about your, and I say you, me, we're more concerned about our happiness than our holiness, but guess what the Lord is more concerned about? Our holiness. And walking with Him and understanding Him and ex expressing our love for Him and, and ex extending our faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 reminds us, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. You can have all the gold in the world. It won't help you one day when you're called up to die. The, the, John Jacob Astor was on the Titanic that will sink his anniversary on the 15th. The day was the maiden voyage of the Titanic in 1912. There were some of the world's richest people on the ship, some scheduled to be who didn't take the voyage. But all of Mrs. Astor's jewelry went to the bottom of the sea, I'll tell you that. And I don't care how much you had, it wouldn't help you in that lifeboat. And if you clung to your luggage, your designer clothes, instead of getting a lifeboat, guess what would happen? You would have sunk. It didn't matter what your title was, what company you were over, how many millions of dollars you had. And Peter reminds us, the trial of your faith, which is more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found into praise and honor and glory to the appearing of Christ. You see, we're living today for that day that day of revelation where we're shown our lives, our opportunities. And the one thing the Lord has asked us to do is to be faithful. That's, that's the standard at the judgment seat of Christ. Were we true to the trust he left us? That's all there is. Everybody can do that. That's not a hard thing. It may be difficult with your, our flesh, but it is a very reasonable thing that the Lord has asked us to do to be faithful to him. Now, these disciples were not being punished. They were being tried without the end goal, with the end goal being the perfection of their faith. There were some lessons they could only learn in this particular storm or the Lord would not have allowed it. Secondly, so they were in the path of duty. They were doing what the Lord told them to do. Don't think that if I just cross all the T's right and dot all the I's and be a good little Christian that nothing bad will ever happen to me. That's a lie from Satan. It'll catch you off guard. And when the storm comes, you'll think that God is not faithful or he doesn't love you. And that's false, bad theology. And it certainly won't happen the day of testing. Secondly, we notice that even though the Lord was with them, it didn't seem like it. The arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own, the old hymn says. And feelings are just that. Why do we put so much stock in feelings? Now, we are emotional creatures. The Lord has made us that way. But faith isn't feelings. I laughingly, I'm going to share this. My younger sister was very athletic. She had played college basketball. And every day of her life, she would be on a rebounder with weights to work out. Well, that sounds good until she wore her knees absolutely out. And her doctor said, you must have a uh, knee replacement. And she said, I'm not going to do it. And he said, oh, yes, you will. And when you come back, I'll have to do both of them instead of just the one because you won't have one to, to be able to rehab on. So just I'll see you again one day. And so it came that day. She finally could not get up the steps to the, the bedrooms. And so I went to pray with her that morning. I never forget. 
and she said, I went in, right before she was to take in the surgery, that, that, that picture you're having both knees replaced. And uh, of course, being her older brother, I was kind of you know, joking around with her and she said, Chris, I don't have peace about this. And I just laughed and I said, you don't have peace about this. I don't have, I never have done anything. I don't feel peace, have the peace of God about. I said, well, you better borrow somebody's peace because you're going to, you're going to go through this trial. This is not based on how you feel. This is just the facts. You've got to have this done today. And we often laugh about that. Faith is not feeling. It's good if you feel good about it, but our faith, your salvation is rest on the fact, resting upon the fact of God's word, not how you feel emotionally about it. It, it, it felt as if he could not possibly be in control. They, they feel like everything is out of control, but he's in perfect control here. And that he didn't even care. Remember, that's what they accused him of. Master, don't you even care that we're about to perish? Again, they were, so, they were reasoning foolishly uh, about the whole matter. I want us to know, child of God, that he has promised, let your conversation, your way of life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. In every storm, we should keep our eyes on the Lord and ask the question, where is he? What, what is he doing? Well, he's at peace. He's got everything under control, knowing what he's about to do and how he's going to do it, and he doesn't have to explain those things to us. He will either deliver us out of it he will take us through it, or he will take us home to be with him. So he's got it in control. Now, these bold, brave, seasoned seamen are reduced to little crying children. Their, their training, their expertise, their knowledge didn't stop one drop of rain or calm one gust of wind. And the psalmist gives us this vivid picture in Psalm 107, verse 23. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. If you want to know there's a God in heaven, go in a boat in a storm. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifted up the storms thereof, the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again into the depths. You can just see this horrible storm. Their soul is melted because of their trouble. They reel to and fro. They stagger like a drunken man. They're at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm calm so that the waves, still, uh, the, the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them into their desired haven. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. These disciples were controlled by fear when we should be controlled by the Holy Spirit and controlled by faith. Fear causes us to act irrationally, selfishly, independently. But we should always ask in a storm, is this a storm that I have caused by my disobedience? Or is it something allowed by the Lord to perfect my faith? It's important to try to get that to that. You may not be able to, but you can always rest in the Lord, in the presence of Christ. And remember the promise of Christ, let us go to the other side. Isaiah 48 verse 2 promises, When thou passest, not if, but when you pass through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee the promise of God to his children he arose the Bible tells us here he rebuked the wind he told it to stop I wonder what he said and he said unto the, the, the sea peace be still but maybe the only words he said those three words and the wind ceased and there was a great calm as great as the storm there was the calm miraculously instantaneously a miracle only the Lord could perform and he said to them, why are you so fearful? Can you see their faces? They've just witnessed. They were scared to death. They thought they were going to drown. They're soaking, drenched in water. And the Lord restores perfect calm like a sheet of glass and said, why are you so fearful? Why is it that you have no faith? Why does he ask them that question? If they thought, they could have reminded themselves, the Lord said what? 
let us go to the other side. If the Lord says we're going to the other side, guess what? We're going to the other side. And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, what manner of man is this, that the wind and the seas obey him? Amy Carmichael wrote, Thou art the Lord who slept on the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the furious sea. What matters beating wind and tossing billow if only we are in the boat with thee? Hold us quiet in the age-long minute while thou art silent and the wind is shrill. Can the boat sink while the Lord is in it? Can the heart faint that waiteth on his will? May the Lord bless his word to us tonight.